Um, well, it really is my very great pleasure to introduce the star of this evening, and that is a master at our inn. Um, that is Master Paul Garlic QC, although he insists that uh, I call him Paul this evening. And so that is how he shall be called. Well, then by way of just a very broad overview and introduction, the reason that we are convened here this evening and all considering the, the topic of this evening, practicing in extradition is um, because Paul and I have seen each other now a couple of times at Cumberland Lodge and we have both spoken about this field in which we both practice. And it struck us that it's a really interesting field of law, intellectually stimulating, uh, lots of opportunities for real court craft, for witness handling, and so we decided that this was something we wanted to talk with you about. And we thought it would be especially interesting for you in a sort of question and answer format like this, um, with me cross-examining, grilling Paul. So we'll do that very shortly. <laughs> um, but first you need to know, I think, a little more about the man and, and who he is. So then um, this uh, living, legend in his own lunch hour. In 1974 then, called to the bar of England and Wales, and um, as you know, a master of the bench at this inn. Um, Paul specialises in uh, several fields, but including amongst them extradition, uh, human rights, and corporate responsibility for human rights violations. Uh, he is actively involved in a number of advisory roles, and those include um, advising on uh, how corporate bodies can comply with their responsibilities and their obligations under various uh, United Nations um, uh, conventions. Uh, so just by way of um, this overview, perhaps if I run through very briefly Paul's appointments and memberships, uh, and it's a, a stellar cast of those. 1996 then appointed Queen's Council. Um, 1997 appointed a recorder of the Crown Court. Um, that is a part-time fee-paid judge in the Crown Court. 2004 um, appointed a judge um, of international war crimes. 2006, and Paul was appointed uh, an international expert to the International Academy of Environmental Sciences. Uh, 2011, uh, as if this wasn't achievement enough, 2011, a uh, member of um, the expert committee on European Union criminal law policy at the European Commission. Uh, in 2014, uh, Paul further diversified and um, became an accredited mediator. Uh, 2018, <clears throat> he became a visiting lecturer at the University uh, of The Hague. And he and I have certainly spoken a number of times about his lecturing and what that involves and how very much he enjoys it and how much he does of it. Um, so just very broadly though, Paul's practice in extradition uh, law um, it, it has comprised both what, what Paul and I would know as part one, that is European Union uh, cases, and part two cases, non-European Union cases. Uh, and when Paul has um, defended in and prosecuted uh, those two types or categories of cases, uh, he's... Um, uh, worked for a number of governments uh, and against a number of governments, and those include advising and working for the uh, governments of the United States of America uh, and working against uh, or, or rather um, defending extradition requests made by um, Russia. Uh, and just by way of a footnote, um, because I think it's especially interesting and impressive, in 2019, uh, Paul acted as the chairman of an independent panel of legal experts, and that panel carried out a detailed review of the circumstances surrounding the investigation of a suspicious death of an American actress in Mumbai. 
well, with very great pleasure then, Paul, may I welcome you this evening and thank you so much for speaking with me. Well, thank you for having me, Abigail. I'm delighted. Excellent. Well, then, if we might start, Paul, just in terms in, in um, quite broad general terms with some introductory overview type of questions, just to set the scene of the context that is extradition. So might I ask you then, Paul, is, is extradition the same as immigration? No, is the short answer. And the reason is that extradition is exactly the opposite of immigration. It's, um, it's emigration, but not of your own free will. It's when one state, which we always call the requesting state, um, makes a request through the, through the diplomatic channel to another state to return um, a fugitive, an alleged fugitive, who is either accused of or has been convicted of an extradition crime. And so it's a process to render, hence rendition, through an extradition treaty, usually, someone who's been accused of or is convicted of a crime in a foreign jurisdiction. And so it, it is a forcible um, uh, act. And you're literally sent, usually with two marshals from the requesting state back to the requesting state to face trial or to con conclude your sentence. Thank you so much, Paul. So uh, it, it can include both accused persons and convicted persons. Yes. So if you've been convicted in a foreign state of an extradition crime and you were abscond, then the, the, the requesting state can make a request for your return. So that you, when, once you returned, you would then complete your sentence. Thank you so much. Is, is extradition different to um, deportation or any yes. similarities between the two? Well, there are similarities because it's both forcible sending someone to a foreign jurisdiction and um, extradition is at the request of a foreign state. So there's a formal request by, by a foreign state, whereas deportation is something which we instigate ourselves in this country, where someone who's not a citizen of the United Kingdom usually has committed a serious criminal offence, or there are other circumstances which make it undesirable for he or she to remain in the United Kingdom. And then the Home Secretary makes an order for deportation. So it is an executive decision, although it's obviously subject to uh, review by the courts, but it's an executive decision rather than a judicial decision. Well, actually that, that's because some extradition is still, an ex is still by the Secretary of State, but deportation is where someone um, is sent back as a result of what we want to do in the UK. We don't want them any longer. Extradition is when a foreign state makes a request to send someone back because they want him for a crime. Thank you so much. And Paul, you mentioned um, a request uh, made in the form of a formal request. How might an English judge in an English court receive that formal request? Um, well, as you mentioned in your introduction, now there are two types of cases, the part one and part two. Part one, uh, we used to call it the European arrest warrant. It's now just called the arrest warrant after Brexit. Um, and, and that's a procedure whereby a, uh, a judge in a foreign jurisdiction, um, a member state of the European Union, can make a can issue a warrant for someone's arrest in that foreign state. They transmit the warrant through usually um, Interpol to the National Crime Agency here. It's authenticated. It's then sent to a judge at the extradition court in Westminster, which is the magistrate's court in Westminster, who deal with all extradition cases, and the judge will enforce it. It's an example of what we call mutual legal recognition. So we, um, because it's been issued by a judge in a member state of the EU, we recognize it as lawful and we will enforce it here. And then we will send someone back on that warrant. Thank you, Paul, you mentioned the judge. Um, what uh, what type of judge sits at first instance at Westminster Magistrates Court in these cases? Well, they are um, a special panel of district judges, so they're DJs, specially trained in extradition, and they deal almost entirely with the extradition cases. And it's it's quite remarkable because when I started practicing in extradition back in sort of 18, 19, 18, no, 18, 1989, um, I mean, we had probably 100 extraditions a year. 
they were all dealt with at Bow Street Magistrates Court when that was still open. And most of them were dealt with by the chief metropolitan stipendiary magistrate. And there were, um, there were very few people practicing extradition. I mean, there were probably only about 20 juniors in England and Wales who practiced an extradition, half a dozen silks, um, because it was a very technical process. And, it was, and it, was a, it, was a, it was a very specialist field in those days. Now, because of the expansion of extradition and the Extradition Act 2003, and then the European arrest warrant, and now our arrest warrant, there are, um, I mean, there are probably about 2,000 extraditions going through Westminster Magistrates Court a year. Well, thank you so much. Um, would you say, Paul, that extradition is a branch of international law? Is it tangential to it? How yeah. might you relate it to international law? Well, I I've always thought about it in this way. It's like doing an extradition case. It's like doing, I mean, just be, the young members of the public won't, won't remember what old style committals were when you had an examining magistrate assessing whether there was a prima facie case. You went before the magistrates and you had an old style committal and you produced the evidence and the magistrate ruled as to whether there was a sufficiency evidence to send someone to trial to the Crown Court. And extradition is a bit like that, but with international knobs on it. So it's a mixture of international law because every extradition is based upon an international instrument. I mean, if it's within, if it's a um, part one case, so it's a, a former European Union case, it's under the uh, the European arrest warrant, the framework decision, which is a, um, a, a binding decision on all the member states. And we've agreed to continue that as part of our post-Brexit agreement. Uh, so that's an international agreement between all the member states of the EU. And now between the EU and the UK, we've got this special arrangement. And for all other countries outside the EU, each country enters into a bilateral extradition agreement if they want to. Not every country has got an extradition treaty, but most have, most civilized countries have. Um, and it's a bilateral uh, agreement. It's an international law agreement, it's a convention, and it's enforceable by the parties as an international instrument. So it is definitely international law. And for example, interpretation of a convention, take um, the best example probably is the US-UK extradition treaty. So that's been negotiated and renegotiated periodically. And it's then ratified both by the Senate and the president in the United States and becomes then part of US law. It's also ratified in the United Kingdom uh, and brought into effect by an act of parliament, which is our Extradition Act 2003. And then that treaty, which has been negotiated between two high, what we call high contracting states, two governments, contains all the terms and all the procedures which apply to extradition between those two countries. Um, and I mean, interestingly enough, just this year, I, I was advising an American law firm in an extradition request, uh, which the US had received from India and the facts very simply were that um, the, the US attorneys that were instructing me and I was advising them had a client who had been convicted of terrorist offenses about 15 years ago involving assisting terrorists in India and also in um, Scandinavia. And he was also charged in America as part of a trial, a, a domestic trial in America with a terrorist act in Mumbai, the, the Mumbai, uh, um, terrorist attacks on the hotel, um, the Taj Mahal Hotel and other hotels. He was acquitted on the Taj Mahal Hotel uh, terrorist cases, but convicted on the, the Scandinavian terrorist cases of assisting terrorists in Scandinavia. And he was sentenced to um, 20 years imprisonment, which is a pretty short sentence by American standards. He served the whole of his term and he was just about to be released when the Indian government made a request for extradition a request to the United States to send him back to India to stand trial for offenses which were very similar to the ones that he'd been acquitted of in relation to the Mumbai bombings. So I was asked to draft an expert opinion on the applicability of um, double jeopardy, the rule non bis in adam, you know, you can't be tried or convicted twice for the same offense. And non bis in idem has a very specialist meaning in international law. Um, and we had to look at the treaty, obviously the treaty between the US and India and, and interpret it 
because in, in the treaty, they use the word, no person shall be tried again for an offense. Mm. And there are two possible interpretations of that. Does that mean the actual wording of the, the offense, the elements of the offense? In other words, it was theft. Does it involve the same ingredients an appropriation of property belonging to another, blah, de, blah, de, blah? And do you just look at the similarities of the elements of the offense? Or do you look at the facts, the factual allegations in the case? And certainly, if you looked at the factual allegations in this case, this man in the US had definitely been acquitted of the factual allegations that he would face if he was extradited to Mumbai. So the question was, which way do you interpret this treaty? And it's a pure international law. It's not actually a, a matter of US law or Indian law or UK law. It's a matter of international law. So you have to look at the Vienna Convention on the interpretation of um, international treaties. And you can look at all the decisions of the International Court of Justice and, and, and also partly the European Court of Human Rights as well. So it was fascinating. I mean, it was a real international law problem. Um, and of course, I, I don't actually practice in India or in the States, but I, I have done extraditions. I mean, I've acted for the US government on many occasions. I've acted for the Indian government on any occasions. So and I was lucky enough just to be instructed because of that experience, I suppose. So a real international law problem. Um, would you, do you think of yourself, Paul, as, a, um, a, a, as an extradition barrister, as also a human rights barrister, or uh, not? Very, very much so, very much so. And it's interesting, Abigail, because when I started practicing in extradition, the way you, uh, if you were defending an extradition, the way that you defended an extradition was to look and to try and challenge what we called authentication of the documents. Because in those days, you had to, most, most requesting states had to prove a prima facie case before you had to prove first that the allegation amounted to an extradition offense, which means, meant really that the conduct with which the, uh, the fugitive, as we call them, was accused uh, would amount to a criminal offense in both jurisdictions, punishable by at least two years imprisonment. That's to show that it's an extradition crime. And, and that's what we call dual criminality. Is it, is it an extradition crime in both jurisdictions? But in addition to that, to prove a prima facie case, because you had to establish a prima facie case, you had to call evidence and you could call witnesses. But if you were dealing with extradition with countries you know, around the world, it was totally impossible to call witnesses. So that we, and still do with some, some um, contracting states, there's a process called authentication where if documents are properly authenticated, they're taken before a judge in the requesting jurisdiction, they're taken on oath, and they're sealed with the appropriate seal, then those documents they can tra be transmitted to the court in Westminster, and the court will receive them as evidence. So in those days, we used to attack expeditions on the basis that they weren't properly authenticated. Mm. And in those days, back in the 1980s, you didn't have skeleton arguments, you just turned up at court if you were prosecuting, and you just had someone like Clive Nichols or, John Hardy or James Lewis against you, and they would just pull out a whole pack of tricks. You know, it's not properly authenticated. The seals are in the wrong place. And it became very, very technical. Um, um, and sometimes you had to really think on your feet and look at the documents and make sure that they were authenticated. Um, and that's the way we used to defend extradition in those days. Authentication to get the evidence out, because if, if you can keep the evidence out, you can't show a prima facie case. And then the second basis would have been that there wasn't sufficient evidence. Because this is all pre the Human Rights Act. I mean, obviously we had the European Convention on Human Rights, we've had that since 1951, but it wasn't part of domestic English law until the Human Rights Act in 1998. So when the Human Rights Act came along, things changed completely because by that time, extradition had become streamlined the Extradition Act of 1998, that had made it much more, had simplified it greatly. Authentication became much less of a problem. And some countries no longer required a prima facie case. So for example, the United States now, if they make a request to the United Kingdom, they do, they do not have to show a prima facie case or the, what they would call a probable cause. Um, there's a bit of an imbalance because we, when we make a request to the US, do still have to show a probable cause. And there's a lot of litigation about the imbalance between this. But um, so with, with, say, the US, you've still got to show a prima facie case. But with other countries, and particularly with the European arrest warrant, all the member states 
so um, uh, um, 28, as they were then, member states, did not have to show a prima facie case. And there was an obligation to extradite under the European arrest warrant. As soon as the arrest warrant was issued, it was shown to be authenticated. But you were allowed to defend extradition on the ground that to send someone back to this jurisdiction in the, in the circumstances of his case um, would cause a real risk that his human rights might be violated. And it's what we call in international law, the rule of non refoulement You can't return someone to a jurisdiction where there is a real risk, substantial risk, that if that person is returned to that jurisdiction, they might uh, suffer a violation of some of their human rights. So at the extradition bar, this was like manna from heaven. It was a new way to fight extradition because the principal grounds to fight extradition now are human rights. And it's become the focus of attention at, at um, a Westminster court now in extradition cases. And the usual routes are article two, the right to life. So if you return someone back to Turkey, for example, and, and I'll come on to a particular case that I defended against Turkey in, in a moment. I mean, there is a real risk that someone could be either be tortured or lose their life if they're returned to Turkey. And the same with Russia. Um, with other jurisdictions, uh, it, there might be a real risk that they would be tortured if they were returned. And Turkey, again, was a prime example of that. Um, and the other ground under the Human Rights Act and under the convention is Article 8, the right to family life. If someone's had got an established way of life here, they've lived here for years and years and years, they've got family commitments, um, long-standing ties, then it is possible. It's difficult, but it is possible to resist jurist, um, extradition on the basis that it would amount to a violation of their right to a family life under Article 8. So now we, we're looking at human rights. And um, I don't know if, I, I think I better just fess up to this straight away because the way I actually became a human rights lawyer was um, uh, not the traditional way. I didn't read, you know, didn't study human rights law at university. Um, but in 1989, I was instructed by the US government to extradite a man called Suring for a murder that had taken place in the state of Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia. And Suring was a very young man at that time, and he and his girlfriend were, uh, had been charged in the States with uh, a brutal murder. I mean, it was the most ghastly murder. They'd, married, ma they'd murdered uh, the girlfriend's parents. They'd slit their throats in their own home, and then they'd just um, fled the jurisdiction. And they, uh, Suring was actually a German citizen, although he lived in America and was a student in America. So he and his girlfriend went on the run and they were finally picked up in London, not on an extradition warrant. They were just passing dud checks because they'd run out of money and they were, they were buying things and staying in hotels using dud checks. They were arrested by the fraud squad. And of course, immediately, as soon as their details were discovered, uh, the Interpol red flag came up because they were wanted in the States for murder. And I was instructed on behalf of the US government to do the extradition proceeding. But at that time in 1989, we had not, we had not ratified the protocol to the European Convention which bans capital punishment. And in Virginia, they have capital punishment and it is used regularly. And there was an almost certainty that if Suring was returned to the US and was convicted of murder, he would face the death sentence and would have been executed. So, um, at that time, um, the European Court of Human Rights had not yet ruled on whether the death sentence amounted to inhumane or degrading treatment. In fact, there were a number of cases in the European Court of Human Rights which said that the death sentence per se is not necessarily inhumane or degrading treatment. I mean, you can either agree or disagree with that, and I strongly now disagree with that, but that, that was the state of the law. So, um, um, the barrister that defended Suring was instructed by the German government because being a German citizen, they came to his assistance and they helped him throughout the proceedings in the UK. And they tried to argue that he shouldn't be uh, returned to the United States because he would, he would face a death sentence. 
And the case went all the way to our House of Lords, as it then was, our highest court. The House of Lords said, no, there's no bar to extradition on the basis that a man will, or woman, could face the death sentence. Um, and uh, they said, no, we, we refuse the appeal. And then the case went to the European Court of Human Rights. And Colin Nichols, because there are two twins, Clive and Colin, Clive is sadly no longer with us, but Colin is, Colin took over the case and he had a brilliant mind, still does. And he knew that he had this problem in the European Court of Human Rights because the court, court had said the death sentence is not necessarily inhumane or degrading treatment in, in the appropriate case. But he, he constructed this wonderful argument on the basis that although the death sentence itself may not be inhumane, if you send a man back to somewhere like the US, he will probably be spending up to 20 years on death row, exhausting all his appeals before he's finally executed. And to spend 20 years on death row is inhumane and degrading treatment. And of course, the European Court of Human Rights just agreed with hook, line and sinker. And, and, um, um, uh, and so they allowed, they allowed the appeal. And Suring then could not be returned until the US government gave an undertaking that they would not ask for the death sentence if he was returned. And so there was more litigation in the UK then, because um, the trouble is the death sentence in the States is a state matter. It's a matter for the individual state. It's not a federal offense murder. There are some federal murders, very few. It's a state prosecution. And therefore it's the state and the state's courts that determine the sentence and the government has no right to interfere. So, there was all this lit now renewed litigation in the UK as to whether or not the US government could give a binding undertaking not to impose the death sentence. They finally persuaded the state prosecutor to agree and they gave a formal undertaking and Soaring was sent back and he was convicted of the murders and he got two sentences of 96 years imprisonment which some may say is probably more inhumane and more degrading than this death sentence. But that whole process of that litigation opened my eyes to the enormity of the death sentence and to human rights. And, and I um, just became passionate about human rights. And from that moment on, sought to be a human rights lawyer. And then when the Human Rights Act came into force, all the circuits and all the bar, we had the training courses for the barristers on the Human Rights Act. And um, so we went around the country teaching about human rights. And by that time, the Council of Europe had got hold of me and I was going all, all over the Council of Europe, just to pretty bizarre jurisdictions, um, Turkmenistan, uh, Azerbaijan, um, teaching people about human rights. So really banging your head against a brick wall in some of these jurisdictions, but it was great fun. Um, and I'll come on to that because we're, I know we're going to talk about sources of law later in, in your questions. And uh, I'll talk, come back to an organization called the, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, which is a little known organization, but it's actually an extremely important organization. It's like a mini United Nations for Europe. Um, but it does actually also include America and Canada as members. But maybe I'll come back to that when you ask me about sources of law, and I'll tell you a bit more about that. So I'm afraid that was a rather long answer to, to a very simple question about how I um, turned from um, um, gamekeeper to poacher. <laughs> well, it was a, a fabulous answer, and we really enjoyed it. A particular highlight for me, I think, was hearing about how uh, technical um, extradition law was when you started, um, I, I suspect now, uh, not recognisable um, no, from the sort of practice no. that I have at Westminster Magistrates Court, much no. more humdrum. It's interesting, uh, uh, Abigail, because when you were acting for the Italians, you wrote an advice and you just said, put as many seals on the documents as you can, <laughs> everywhere, I want a seal on every page, and they did. <laughs> well, I, I really enjoyed that, hearing about how courts um, receive documents, authentication. I really like the idea of um, you for the government being challenged by one of your friends and peers, yes. perhaps even from the same set of chambers, about whether yes. the court could actually see the, the, the stamp, yep. the court seal. Yep. Fantastic. Um, and of course, and, and that, that is still important because under some of the treaties, 
you still have to authenticate documents. India, for example, Australia, you still have authentication. So it's something that extradition practitioners um, need to just think, get by an old copy of an, a partially brew of an extradition and tell you all about authentication. Mm. Well, um, and I appreciate that because it sounds to me all, all like um, rule of law points, but no doubt now a judge would uh, take a dim view when it comes to certainly European Union cases and would see it as um, shameless technical points, uh, but, but I might be wrong. Well, Paul, might I ask you then, um, moving away from your travels overseas and all of that um, grand stuff that we will come to, um, where in this country, in the United Kingdom, does an extradition case start? It starts at Westminster. Um, Westminster has a, um, a, a, the sole jurisdiction to deal with extradition cases. So all, that's why they've got this specially trained bench of district judges who, who know all about extradition and specialise in it. Um, and they, they always have historically, it used to be Bow Street, and then it was Horsfree Road, and now of course Horsfree Road moved to Westminster. And, and in, in the most serious extradition case, you usually find the, the chief metropolitan magistrate deals with it. So Judge Arbarthot used to deal with, hey, she's, I think she's recently retired, isn't she? You're right, yes, February yeah. this year. Now um, the chief magistrate is District Judge Goldspring. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Paul, to, to which court or to which courts do you appeal an extradition order? To the High Court, to the, um, the, the Administrative Division of the High Court. And again, there's a specially trained bench of, uh, of, of High Court judges that, that deal with extradition cases. Thank you. Well, you, you might have answered this already, but um, can you, as a barrister, both prosecute an extradition request and defend it? Well, not in the same case, <laughs> but, but you can certainly. I mean, I, I started off um, as a junior really prosecuting and acting for the foreign states. So um, I was lucky enough to go out to Hong Kong, to India a couple of times, Canada on extradition cases in the preliminary stages, gathering the evidence. Um, but then um, equally, uh, when I took silk, most of my practice was defense. I still did a bit of prosecute acting for the, the requesting state, most of it was defense. So if you look at the practitioners now um, at Raymond buildings and elsewhere, your set obviously, Yes, you can both prosecute and defend. So you're acting, you can act for the foreign government in some cases or for the fugitive in other cases. And, and I think it's a very good thing to do. It really keeps your, um, your just keeps you agile because you can see things from both sides. And there, it's a different skill set defending to prosecuting. Um, how might you begin if you were instructed by a government to prosecute an extradition request? Um, all right, so I think we're now we're talking about part two cases, because if it's a European arrest warrant, it will, the, the warrant will come, well, and as we call it, just the arrest warrant, now the warrant will come through. So if you are prosecuting, the first thing you do is to look at the treaty, because the treaty has all the procedural law you need for that particular case, and it can differ. I mean, our treaties do differ, differ with different states, so you've got to focus on the treaty. And you've got to see um, what documents are required by way of, of the request in non-arrest warrant cases, so non-European cases. The request is made by the foreign, uh, by the requesting state, by the foreign state through the diplomatic channel. It comes through the diplomatic bag. And the treaty will provide the whole scheme for extradition between those, those two high contracting states. It will define for the purpose of the treaty what is an extradition offence, what you have to establish to make it an extradition offence, because you can't be extradited for any old offence. Um, it has to be an extradition offence. And as I said, by and large, that's an offence which is punishable if the conduct took place in both jurisdictions, would be punishable in both jurisdictions with at least two years imprisonment. But some treaties treat things differently, and particularly the very old treaties, because there are some countries, and um, India, we We've modernized it a bit, but it, it's almost colonial. It goes back to the old extradition treaties of 1872. So the treaty is the first place to start because that will show you if you're prosecuting what you need to do and the hurdles you've got to get over in order to be successful in the extradition request. Thank you. 
Um, and Paul, sticking with prosecuting for a moment, if you were instructed to prosecute in order to do your preparation, might you have contact with um, consulate staff at an embassy? What, what sort of research might you do? Uh, well, at the bar, we're instructed uh, by the Crown Prosecution Service. It used to be the director of the public prosecutions, but now the CPS deal with extradition. They've got a specialist extradition squad in, in London, a department in London. So your instructing solicitor is the CPS. So you would always go through them because they are your client. But uh, you certainly, when you're, when you're given your instructions, the first thing you do would be to look at all the documents, look at what's been sent through to you um, it's you're probably going to get the documents before the request because the government will want to get everything sorted out, everything in order, so that when the request is made, they can make an arrest warrant, they can arrest somebody, and the proceedings are ready to go. You don't want to arrest someone on an extradition warrant and find that you've got no evidence, and then there's going to be a discharge and you have to start all over again. So most sensible governments will probably contact the CPS and you'll be instructed and you'll be asked to advise. So you'll advise on the evidence. Um, if, if there's an evidential requirement, you'll advise on what are the extradition chart offences disclosed on the evidence. And you'll advise, if it's still a case where you have to have documents authenticated, advise on that. And that will be done through your instructions list from the CPS. But invariably, usually you probably will have some contact with the, the lawyer in the foreign jurisdiction. So when I was doing a lot of cases for the United States, the Department of Justice in Washington was our first call, and you get to know people very well. And I, I can tell you a little interesting story, because in the old days, when extradition was such a rarefied, that there was one person at the Director of Public Prosecutions, when they were still in Queen Anne's Gate, the, the old DPP, one person dealt with all extraditions. And he was a man, delightful man, called Michael Q. And he was a very old-fashioned chap. He didn't quite wear a bowler hat, but he did occasionally wear a black jacket and striped trousers. Member of the bar, and never let you forget he was a member of the bar. If you ever wrote an advice and called him your instructing sister, he would, you know, be furious. But Michael was the most charming man, and he knew everything that there was to know about extradition. And in those days, we didn't have law reports. I mean, they weren't online anyway. And uh, extradition cases rarely made the law reports. They were usually in the Times newspaper. And so Michael, or you had the transcript from the court, Michael had this room with boxes of transcripts of cases of all the decided cases in extradition going back to the 19th century. And he, he was just known around the world as Mr. Extradition. And you, I, I, I can remember speaking to lawyers in the States and in Hong Kong, and you mentioned Michael Q's name, around the world and say, oh, Mr. Q. And they all say, when you answer that you phone him up in London, he would pick up the telephone and say, Q speaking. <laughs> and they just knew that this was the man they had to speak to. And Michael did that for years. And he taught me everything I know about extradition. Um, and he would be the link. And through him, um, occasionally, if it was a really technical bit, I remember receiving a set of instructions from him. They, my instructions were just two or three lines. It says, Council has here with the documents from the Australian government. Your, ins your, your instructed lawyer will never be able to understand this. Please advise. <laughs> 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 and we did actually have the Australian lawyers come over and, and we had many happy lunches in Gray's Inn with Michael and um, uh, ex explaining the law to them. So yes, you do have, you will either directly or indirectly through your advice, you'll be, you'll be um, dealing with them. And if there's an appeal after the proceedings in the magistrates in front of the district judge, if there's an appeal to the high court, uh, almost uh, it's very usual for one, a lawyer from the foreign jurisdiction to come over and, and um, be in court because they're actually obviously they're very interested in the result. So you'll probably have a lawyer come over. Excellent. And um, Paul, when, when you were prosecuting and you instructed counsel will do the needful. Um, yes. How about when you were then tasked to defend? Where might you start? Uh, when where might you first start when you were instructed to defend? Uh, well, um, in those days, if it was a if it was a non-European arrest warrant case, you'd look at the authentication. Have they got it right? And you'd keep quiet, and and until you got to court, and then you'd you'd let the time bomb off. So you'd look at authentication. And then there were provisions under the old extradition act of, uh, um, where um, you could you could resist extradition on the basis that the the request was oppressive, 
or for or was being made um, in bad faith, which is what we used to use when the Russians made a request, that it was politically motivated, it was in bad faith. So then you have to start gathering your own evidence because you can't just say to the magistrate, well, the Russians are making this application in bad faith and it's, and it's oppressive because the magistrate said, well, what evidence have you got? I'm not gonna make that finding. So you would then have to find some evidence, which I suppose leads us on to the sort of sources of law mm -hmm. and, the, and how you, you still have to do this because now if you're arguing a human rights point, if you're arguing uh, non refoulement someone will um, be tortured or might be, um, their death might, might, might suffer a death penalty, you've got to have good evidence. So you need sources for that. And the principal sources are um, government departments like the United, Nation, the, the, the United States Department um, of Foreign Affairs has annual reports, human rights reports on pretty well every country. And they're a great source of information. They're very detailed analyses of the human rights position in almost every country around the world. Um, and then there's Human Rights Watch. That's an NGO, which is extremely good. Um, these are all on the website and they do a very similar thing. They're more defense orientated than government orientated, but they're very, very thorough indeed. Obviously, Amnesty International is helpful as well, their reports. But the, um, the other real source of information is um, at the Council of Europe, because the Council of Europe do human rights reports and they're very authoritative. No one's going to suggest that a Council of Europe report is anything less than completely authoritative. And also the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And the OSCE is a really fabulous organization. Um, and I got involved with the OSC because I, um, went out and did some work for them in Azerbaijan and ran some uh, trial monitoring projects for them in Azerbaijan. Um, and I can remember very well how that came about because I was, I was prosecuting a case for the Serious Fraud Office, which was stopped as an abusive process, quite rightly. There'd been all problems with non-disclosure. So what was going to be a three-week, tr three-month trial in my diary in Bristol just evaporated. I had nothing to do at all, no work. So I went back to Chambers and I got this phone call from someone at the OSCE in Baku in Azerbaijan saying, you know, we've heard that you do human rights work and you're reasonably well respected. Would you like to come over to Baku, to Azerbaijan, to set up and run this trial monitoring um, program for a very high profile political trial. We've just had elections in Azerbaijan. There were riots. The authoritarian government has arrested all the members of the opposition party and all the members of the opposition press and charged them with treason, insurrection, and um, the trial's going to be terribly unfair. We need to have an observer and someone to run a trial. So I said, yes. And I put the phone down. And I can remember putting the phone down and reaching out for my atlas to find out where Azerbaijan was because I wasn't quite sure. And I was meant to be going out there for six weeks and it turned out I was out there for only six months living in Baku and working for the OSCE. And my goodness, when you work in a field office like that, um, it, it, it's, it's a wonderful experience. The mixture of uh, local people and international staff and I learned so much about um, human rights, running a, a trial and writing the report. And if, if anybody's actually interested in, in fair trial rights, and I I'm, I'm, suppose I'm um, being slightly self-congratulatory, but if they look um, at the fair trial reports of the trial monitoring in Azerbaijan, the first one I did was in 2004. And the, my introductory section covers probably all the law that you ever need on fair trial rights and the rights of the accused. I mean, I had a lot of people helping me as well, but it was a fascinating experience. And, and it, it, when I came back to the UK, I certainly traded on that. I now won't go to court without it. Oh, thank you for the, thank you for the, uh, <laughs> the heads up. Um, and in terms of uh, English sources of law, um, thank you so much for the, the overview of international sources. Which, um, which acts of parliament might we look to if we were considering extradition proceedings? For, um, for non-EU states, it's the Extradition Act 2003, and there have been amendments to it. 
And the best starting point, if anybody is actually wants an introduction to the law on extradition, if they go online and look at the House of Lords report, Lord Brown, Stephen Brown, um, Lord Justice Brown, as he was, and then Lord Brown in, in the Supreme Court, um, Stephen Brown, Simon Brown, rather, uh, was the chairman of this, the select committee. And the report explains extradition so well for, for not just for lawyers, for non-lawyers. And um, I gave evidence to them, and so did a lot of other extradition practitioners. So it's a really thorough and comprehensive overview of the law on extradition and how it works in practice. It's a very good starting point. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, now I'd like to move really to focusing on, on your practice and your, um, your memories of perhaps the, uh, the most stellar cast of villains that you either prosecuted in extradition or defended. Um, <laughs> which is the most memorable client? But actually, the most memorable client uh, uh, wasn't in an extradition case, although it did involve extradition. And I was a baby barrister. I was probably only about three or four years tall. And I was instructed as the junior in a murder case. And I had a Welsh QC called Winston Guthrie Jones, the long departed, I'm afraid, um, who had a very Welsh accent. And I remember we went to, Br this, is, this is way before the, uh, the protocol on the death sentence. And we went to Brixton prison. We went into the, the legal visit section and there was my QC and I was there taking the notes and we went into the, the reception and we went into the room where our client was and we sat down and the client turned to us and he said, the first thing he said to us, gentlemen, please never allow yourself to be left in a room alone with me because if you do, I will have to murder you. So I looked at my leader, he looked at me and he said, it's nothing personal. <laughs> it's just that um, I'm, in, in addition to the murder here, I'm also wanted for a murder in, in the States. And if I, uh, if I commit a murder here, another one, they will never extradite me back to the States. <laughs> and I don't want it to be you, gentlemen. <laughs> Uh, uh, well, the perfect logic, actually, it's a really good plan. <laughs> uh, but in extradition terms, uh, there are all there are different. I mean, Suring was a memorable case because it became it's become sort of the seminal case on human rights and the death sentence and inhumane uh, behaviour. So that was the most formative case, without doubt. I think some of the Hong Kong cases because I did the last extradition uh, for the Hong Kong government before the handover and the first one after handover. And to see the difference was quite remarkable. Not the difference in law, it's actually remained the same. But uh, the first time I went out to the Ministry of Justice in Hong Kong, they were all British. There were British police officers on the street. And then the next time I went out, they were all Chinese lawyers and there were Chinese police officers. And it was, it was the contrast was um, very, very stark. Um, well, I, I have to say, in those days, just after handover, I was quite impressed with the Chinese. I'm not not impressed at all now. I mean, I would never act for the Hong Kong government, and I'm not going to be. Uh, I'm not going to deal with one of our colleagues who we all know took our brief for the Hong Kong government. I certainly wouldn't. That was memorable. Um, but in terms of just emotional impact, I can remember oh very clearly. I just had a very bad cycle accident in London. I got knocked off my bicycle in the King's Road. You know, I came back from Afghanistan on, from a mission. I'm perfectly safe. A weekend after I came back from Afghanistan, I got knocked off my bicycle in the King's Road and ended up in hospital. So, you know, it's bad luck, isn't it? Uh, but I was defending in an extradition case um, in front of John Zani, you know, the district judge at uh, Westminster. Now, John, Used, when he was in private practice before he became a district judge, used to send me a lot of extradition work. All his attack, he had this Italian clients. <laughs> and he phoned me up one day and he said, Paul, you've got to take this case. I said, John, why? He said, well, it's because of the client's name. And he said, what's his name? He said, he's called Mr. Alio, which is Italian for garlic. So we had this conference and halfway through the conference, the client realized it clicked and he stood up and he says, Io Alio, your garlic. And he sort of embraced me. It didn't do much good because we lost the case, unfortunately, <laughs> but I can remember it. it was so John Zani became a district judge at Westminster. And years and years later, after this accident, the first case I did back on my feet in court was an expedition where I was defending someone who was alleged to be a terrorist, a terrorist in, in the Kurdish region of Turkey and a member of the AKP. AKP. 
And our defense was that if he it was a very serious charge, he was charged with two murders. He'd murdered two people, and there was pretty strong evidence he had murdered these people. Our defense was if we return returned to Turkey, we would be tortured and probably would be tortured to death. Now that's a very difficult allegation to sustain in court. We were really lucky. We found a witness in London who had been granted, our client had been granted asylum, but this other uh, client uh, man had been granted asylum on the same grounds because he'd been tortured. He had shared a cell with our client. And on one of the nights when our client was interrogated, he was brought back to the cell and he had a broken leg. And this other prisoner had to use his belt to strap it up and make a sort of makeshift splint. And I can remember calling this witness in the court in uh, Westminster, you could hear a pin drop. And this man was so obviously telling the truth, he knew every detail. And um, I can remember he reached the point where he said that my client was brought back to the cell and he could see that his leg was so badly broken, he took his belt out and he took a, a piece of wood from the bench and he made a splint. And I looked up and I could see there were tears in John Zani's eyes. He had to rise, he was so, uh, we knew we'd won the case from that Gosh. moment onwards. And John came back, reserved judgment, came back. He'd written a judgment which was completely unappealable. <laughs> he made findings of fact. Um, uh, it, was, it was just a memorable judgment. And I've always been impressed with John Zani. I mean, he really um, dealt with the case totally independently. And he was absolutely satisfied there would be torture and refused extradition. And it was the way he wrote the, the, the actual decision was totally unappealable. He did it so well. Goodness. And I think that's the most emotionally charged case I've ever done. Yes. And, and Paul, you were asked a very particular question, weren't you, um, once in a case conference? <laughs> Yes, I was. It, it never actually came to an actual hearing for reasons I'll explain in a moment. Yes, I was. Um, I received a brief from a firm of solicitors I'd never heard of before, never done any work for them, and I was asked to have a conference. And, and I was in Silk, and it was actually a rather well-paid conference, I have to say. So we arranged the conference, and the client came in, um, and it was. Now it was the allegation was interesting. He was a Venezuelan, and he'd been the Minister of Defence. For Venezuela and he and 11 of his other cronies had entered into a, a sale and lease bank of the whole Venezuelan Navy. They sold the Navy and leased it back but unfortunately the proceeds of sale never got into the bank account they just divided up between them so they'd sold the Navy, got the money and done a run it and he was in London and the Venezuelans were thinking about making a request and he knew this so he wanted some legal advice. So he we arranged a conference and he came in and he introduced himself. And he said, I won't try and do a, a Spanish Venezuelan accent, but he said, Mr. Garlic, I have, I've only got one question for you at the moment. So I thought, well, that's pretty good. I'm getting paid an awful lot for this conference. I only want one question. He said, it's a very important question. It's very important. So I said, well, what is it? He said, there are 12 of us who are, are probably going to be extradited. Please, will you tell me the names of the top 12 QCs that the Venezuelan government might instruct <laughs> to conduct the extradition. And so I gave him a list of all the extradition silks that could come to mind, the Nickel Brothers, uh, James Hardy, uh, John, uh, jo all the usual characters, Alan Jones, myself, um, um, you know, Claire Montgomery, and he wrote them all down. And I said, um, why do you want this? Well, we're gonna instruct them tomorrow for the defense. And the next morning, 12 separate people delivered 12 defense briefs to all those QCs, which conflicted them. They could never act for the requesting government. <laughs> utterly, utterly ingenious. Ingenious, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It never came to anything because we, we, we didn't have a treaty with Venezuela. We refused to, to enter into a, so that there was no extradition, but it was an interesting conference. <laughs> well, Paul, thank you so, so much. We're just a few minutes um, before half past seven, and I don't want to trespass on the, the half an hour or so that um, our students will now have to ask you questions, uh, me some questions. So perhaps we'll move um, away from uh, the, the crushed garlic, which is you on the King's Road, and that poor, <laughs> uh, 
Italian Mr. Garlic. Yes. And we'll move to um, the bright, bright young things of the future in extradition law. Of course. Uh, and um, I would simply like, before I do that, though, to say thank you ever so much for such a superbly interesting conversation. Um, you and I have, have um, spoken about some of these topics at Cumberland Lodge at our inn over lunch, but I've been so pleased to fill in some of the background and context. It's been delightful speaking with you this evening. Well, it's a pleasure. And I've, I'm always very happy to pass on experiences because it's it, the mar one thing about the bar is you can never plan anything in your life at the bar. These <laughs> things happen and all of a sudden your life just takes a complete change to a different era of practice completely, doesn't it? Absolutely. It's yes, it's serendipitous. <laughs> it is serendipity, absolutely. Well, thank you so, so much. Um, and so, Marlene, over to you, I think, uh, to compare the next um, half an hour or so. We may run a little short. Let's see.